It has been said that long before the dawn of man, before even the oldest ice, there lived the shadowy, forgotten ancestor of the Neanderthals. These humans shaped the Neanderthals from mud and ice, gifting them fire and wisdom before vanishing beyond the heavens. But they did not die. They slumber beneath the glaciers, their bones whispering in the cold void of time. Imagine Europe three hundred thousand years ago, where the air hums with the rustle of ancient forests, the bellows of megafauna echo across the plains, and for several months the night sky flared with the blinding death of a star, a supernova casting its eerie glow over a landscape teeming with life. In this primal theatre, two remarkable sites in Germany, Bilsingsleben and Schöningen, emerge as stages where our ingenious ancestors crafted lives of startling complexity. The Heidelbergian period is a term used to describe a phase in European prehistory, roughly spanning 600,000 to 300,000 years ago in Europe. This period represents a crucial step in human evolution, where we find the first hints of early Neanderthals. This period is often referred to as Heidelbergian, because of the great debate over which species should be recognized and the attribution of fossils. Due to the ambiguities of human species classification, we will refer to this human population as proto-Neanderthals. In biology, a clade includes a common ancestor and all of its descendants, meaning it encompasses the entire evolutionary lineage stemming from that ancestor. The morphology of the Heidelbergian clade remains a subject of ongoing debate. The fossil evidence from Bilsingsleben in Germany and Vertisolos in Hungary suggests that these populations belong to proto-Neanderthals. Generally speaking, these proto-Neanderthals are categorized as belonging to a long and incredibly diverse lineage of humans that lived in Europe during the Heidelbergian period. Several facial reconstructions have been carried out, giving him an expression of a man weighed down by the punishing, relentless burden of life in prehistoric Europe. This human was robust, with a large brain capacity and pronounced brow ridges, traits that would later become more distinct in the classic Neanderthals. The leg bones of Bilsingsleben man are quite robust, similar to those of Neanderthals, an adaptation to the cold climate, increased physical activity, or both. Bilsingsleben man and his counterparts appear to have had a sturdy skeleton all around, which would have carried a strong muscular body. His bones were thicker than those of modern man, indicating immense strength. The robustness suggests males were roughly six feet, 1.8 meters, in height, with a body mass of around 15 stone, around 215 pounds, roughly speaking, making him one of the most powerfully built hominins ever discovered. A stone is a unit of weight equal to 14 pounds. And make no mistake, these men were absolute beasts, with dense and strong muscle used to throwing their massive heavy spears and intense confrontational hunting practices. Strongly delineated brows, a receding forehead, a relatively low face, a depression between the eyebrows, post-orbital constriction, sharply delineated ridges below the eye sockets, a weak chin, strong and thick jaws, an obvious sexual dimorphism, with males being noticeably more robust than females, are some of their features. The Bilsingsleben skull is believed to be male, and the skull resembles an archaic Homo sapiens to some extent, rather than a typical Neanderthal-like morphology. His brain cavity has a volume of roughly 1,200 cubic centimetres, equivalent to around two and a half pints of Guinness draft. In other measurements favoured by some anthropologists, the brain cavity held approximately 16,500 grains of water, and estimated in dried millet seed, the brain cavity equaled 36 ounces in Prussian apothecary's weight. This volume is on the lower end of the range of variation for later Neanderthal males. At Bilsingsleben, circular arrangements of stones and bones whisper of shelters, huts or windbreaks, built with a rugged elegance reminiscent of the mammoth bone huts later fashioned by Cro-Magnons. At Schöningen, spears, carved with precision from carefully chosen Norway spruce, reveal an advanced arboreal knowledge that speaks to a deep intelligence. How did these ancient humans, living on the edge of survival, construct their tools with such skill, 
and what do these sites tell us about their mastery of bone, hide, wood, and stone? Let's begin at Bilsingsleben, nestled in the rolling hills of Thuringia, eastern Germany, where the sediments of a spring-fed lake have locked away secrets from 370,000 to 350,000 years ago. Picture a warm, interglacial period, marine isotope stage 11, when the climate bathed the region in mild temperatures, coaxing forth dense forests of oak, hazel and spruce, their canopies alive with the calls of birds and the rustle of deer. By the lake's edge, Heidelberg man left his mark. Three circular arrangements, each three to four metres wide, crafted from stones and bones too large to ignore. This wasn't haphazard. It was architecture born of necessity and insight. How did they learn to balance weight and stability, to weave bone and hide into a home? The answer lies in their hands, calloused from trial and error, and their minds sharp enough to see potential in a carcass. These aren't random scatters, large rocks, some weighing 20 kilograms, sit alongside elephant ribs, rhino skulls, and tusks, arranged with a purpose that tugs at our curiosity. Were these the foundations of huts, their rocky bases anchoring frames of wood, bone, and hide, much like the mammoth bone shelters of later Cro-Magnons? The scene comes alive, humans dragging boulders from the shore, wedging them with the skeletal remains of their kills, then lashing branches and stretching hides to fend off the wind and rain. Bilsingsleben's forests brimmed with spruce, oak and hazel, wood for fires, perhaps poles for huts. The shelter's frames likely used branches, lashed with sinew, their builders knowing which trees bent without breaking. These structures suggest more than a fleeting visit. The sheer effort Hauling a stone the size of a small child or an elephant rib, longer than a man is tall, speaks of intent, of a camp meant to endure weeks, perhaps months. Within the circles, flint tools pile up, hand axes, scrapers and flakes, alongside ash and burnt seeds that hint at fires crackling in the centre. One circle boasts a gap, an entrance facing away from the prevailing winds, a detail so practical it feels modern. Could they have sat there, sheltered from the elements, splitting bones for marrow and sharpening tools by firelight? The bones themselves, elephants, rhinos, deer, show cut marks, some cracked open, their size and weight suggesting they doubled as structural beams. Picture a hide stretched taut over a frame of ribs, pinned by rocks, the interior smoky and warm, a refuge in a world of prehistoric predators and weather. Did Bilsingsleben's early human builders pioneer this art, blending bone and stone in a dance of survival? Now, shift your gaze 125 miles northwest to Schöningen, in Lower Saxony, where a lignite mine's muddy depths cradled a different tale from just over 300,000 years ago. Here, during this time, the landscape morphed into a patchwork of woods and steppe, a lake shimmering at its heart. No stone circles greet us, but wooden spears, eight of them, rise from the sediment like relics of a lost craft. However, these aren't mere stabbing sticks. They're balanced, tapered throwing weapons, their bases broad and their tips fire-hardened, sanded and carved from the Norway spruce, with a care that staggers the mind. Horse bones butchered by the dozens litter the site, their ribs and skulls untouched by architectural ambition. Think about that. 300,000 years ago, humans were creating finely crafted throwing spears, not just crude stabbing spears. It wasn't so long ago that archaeologists thought this was a modern invention. The Schöningen spears elevate this intelligence to a new plane. These weapons stunned archaeologists with their sophistication, balanced like modern javelins, their centre of gravity a third from the base, ideal for thrusting or throwing. The Norway spruce grows up to elevations of about 2,000 to 2,500 metres, roughly 6,500 to 8,000 feet above sea level. Analysing the wood under a microscope, the wood's tight, narrow rings reveal slow growth from higher elevations. Norway spruce closely related to the Siberian spruce, grows slow in high elevations, half a millimetre a year or less. 
its dense, elastic fibers forged by cold winds and thin soils. A tree, one and a half inches thick at the base, and six and a half feet tall, might have taken forty to sixty years to reach that size. Why did they choose Norway spruce over pine or birch? Its strength and resilience, hard yet flexible, could pierce horsehide without snapping, a quality the trees achieved by decades of slow growth. Indeed, the care in selection boggles the mind. These trees weren't grabbed from the nearest thicket. They were sought out, tested, felled, then meticulously shaped. The thickest end, near the root, became the base, tapering naturally to a point, some tips charred to harden them further. This wasn't luck. It was knowledge, passed down through generations. Picture a hunter hiking miles up a steep mountain to find the perfect tree, then bending a spruce, bending it to test its strength, testing dozens before nodding in approval. The eight surviving spears range in length from around two meters to 2.5 meters, roughly six and a half to over eight feet, with diameters between 30 and 50 millimeters, between one and two inches. The replica throwing spears, designed to match the original's dimensions and balance, typically weigh between 0.7 to 1 kilogram, roughly 1.5 to 2.2 pounds, for the throwing spears, remarkably similar to modern javelins. Thrusting spears would be heavier due to their sturdier build and greater diameter. The lightweight design made them extremely practical, whether thrown or thrust. Their balance was key, with the center of gravity carefully positioned for effective use. The spear's balance suggests these early humans understood weight distribution, an engineer's instinct in a hunter's soul. Schoeningen's spear technology was laser sharp a specialization born of need and generations of trial and error. Another spear point found at Clacton on the sea and dating to around 400,000 years ago was made of yew, likely due to the lack of high elevation trees in that region. This advanced arboreal wisdom ties these sites together. These humans could read their woodlands like a book, spruce for strength, oak for fuel, hazel for flexibility. How did they learn this? Through years of watching trees grow, testing their give, and remembering what worked. Bilsingsleben and Schoeningen show this level of intelligence started much earlier than the Cro Magnons. The U Swear analysis of Bilsingsleben man's tools yielded several interesting finds. Archaeologists believe that analysis of the base of his stone tools reveal that they likewise attach stone points to sticks. It's an important step in human development as it involves putting together two materials, the stone and stick, to form a composite tool. A Neanderthal site in Italy has also yielded the remains of sticks, which could have been used as handles for tools. If Schoeningen's humans dispatched horses with such precision, they surely had hides aplenty, tough, pliable hides that they could drape over a frame of ribs or branches weighted by stones pried from the lake bed. The site's waterlogged preservation favoured wood over bone, but imagine a hunting party, flush with a kill, erecting a shelter nearby, horse ribs arched into a dome, hides lashed tight, rocks pinning the edges. What unites these sites is their mastery of materials, an intelligence that shines through their use of animal remains and their astonishing arboreal expertise. At Bilsingsleben, the shelter's bones weren't just refuse, they were chosen. Elephant ribs for length, rhino skulls for heft, integrated with stones to form a sturdy base. Hides, implied by the scrapers littering the site, likely came from deer or horses, their hides stretched to seal the huts. Bilsingsleben during this time was a golden age, warm, wet and stable, with pollen painting a lush scene. Forests thick with conifers and hardwoods, the lake a magnet for game. Temperatures averaged around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, or 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, summers balmy, winters mild. This bounty let them linger, building shelters to exploit elephants and rhinos drawn to the water. The Schoeningen site's time frame was cooler, perhaps averaging 5 to 10 degrees Celsius, 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, with a lake edged by sparser woods and steppe. 
Horses roamed this open land, prime for spear hunts, but winters bit harder, summers shorter. The site of Vertisolos in Hungary, dated to around 315,000 years ago, presents evidence of hearths, suggesting that fire was controlled for warmth and cooking. Stone tools recovered from the site indicate that these humans crafted flake tools and scrapers from local materials. Burnt bones further reinforce the notion that fire was an integral part of their survival strategies. Flint knives, scrapers, and cutting tools indicate that these early humans were skilled at processing hides, wood, and food. Research found evidence through the useware analysis that the Vertesolos man was working wood with their stone tools, likely to turn it into useful wooden tools. Perhaps the strangest finding was evidence for drilling. Archaeologists don't know what they were drilling into or why, but they were certainly making holes with their stone tools. These sites reflect a mind that observed, learned and innovated, early Neanderthals as architects and engineers. What drove such brilliance, the harsh climate, the challenge of the hunt, or a sky ablaze with auroras? Whatever fueled this innovation, their works endure, silent testaments to a people who turned bones into homes and trees into weapons, crafting survival into something extraordinary. This completely destroys the myth that Neanderthals were simple cavemen and suggests they would have taken as much care in crafting their clothing and in their appearance as well. These humans were living in settled camps, master woodworkers, bone workers, and stone workers, and so the idea that they were stomping around in crude animal skins should also be dismissed. They likely were skilled in working with animal hides and fur, and though we don't have evidence they used needles and thread, there is evidence they used something better. Birch bark glue. This invites us to speculate. Did the use of birth bar glue for attaching spearheads to shafts actually originate as a glue used for making clothing and garments? Indeed, the analysis shows that early Neanderthal man would have had an interest in clothing. Evidence from another site in Germany shows they were hunting beavers and carefully removing their hides, suggesting they targeted beavers for their pelts. A certain proportion of tools associated with this population were being used for the working and scraping of hides. If they are depressing the hides, if they are softening hides, they can use the hides for fur clothing, something no Ice Age European would dare live without. Scientists are still trying to determine the details. For instance, it is possible that Bilzing Slebenman was making handles with sticks. While not useful for hunting, a handle would act as an extension of the tool and you can hold it while you are scraping or engraving. Researchers are also trying to determine whether Bilsingsleben man used some form of sticky organic material to aid in the process of hafting a spear. Recent findings suggest that hafted obsidian knives, stone blades attached to wooden handles, may have also been part of their toolkit. The ability to haft tools to a spear marks a significant cognitive leap. If Bilsingsleben man was using spears, hafted knives and fire, should we consider them primitive, or were they already approaching the capabilities of modern humans? However, the question remains, were these populations direct ancestors of Neanderthals, or were they replaced by them? Did the Pilsingsleben man undergo an evolutionary process known as Neanderthalization, where they evolved into Neanderthals? Neanderthals are now considered an offshoot of Homo sapiens, having evolved separately in Europe, but how much interbreeding occurred between these groups remains unclear. Lastly, enter the supernova, a cosmic flare 300,000 years ago associated with Geminga, a neutron star located about 550 light-years from Earth. The Schöningen sight straddles this moment in time. Imagine a star exploding, its light outshining the moon for months, its gamma rays bathing Earth. What might these human ancestors have dreamed beneath that ancient starlit sky? And with that, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. But before you go, please like, subscribe and comment. Thank you and take care.